go. Uh, good morning, I, Chris Ohl, Wake Forest Infectious Diseases, Wake Forest Baptist Health. Um, so uh, here we are, today is the 13th of uh, August, um, about five and a half months uh, into um, our pandemic, um, at least as far as our local North Carolina portion of it. So um, again, we have some great questions uh, submitted um, by some of uh, some of the um, our viewers, and but before that, I want to just mention a few things um, that are kind of new and, and update, and um, to try to clarify some things that have been in the media in the past week or so. First of all, our numbers. So um, uh, nationwide, um, the the big surge, um, I think, as it was labeled by the media, in numbers in the southwest, in the south, um, and in the other southeast southern tier states uh, appears to have peaked and in most areas is declining. The numbers are still relatively high if you, if you look at the curves, uh, but they're, they're clearly coming down. Um, and uh, this would include, in, uh, particularly in Arizona and California, uh, but also in Texas and uh, to some extent in Florida um, and, uh, and Georgia. Um, the, 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 when I say they're still pretty high, um, if you look at what they were compared to the beginning of June, they're still about five, six times the numbers of cases that are occurring daily. Um, so um, a little bit more work to do in those areas. So why did they go up so fast? Well, we've talked about that. A lot of it was because of a very robust uh, and aggressive, um, quote, opening of their economies, including some of the areas where transmission is known to occur fairly readily, uh, and that includes in, uh, in bars, large gatherings of people, um, and then in, in family and friends, social activities. Um, so with masking and with um, rolling back some of the, the, those openings, um, particularly bars and, and restaurants, the numbers I think have come down. So it does show that some of our mitigation that we can do short of completely sheltering in place do, do work. And again, appeal for people to wear their masks, um, avoid large gatherings, and to be smart about your family and friend gatherings. And we've talked a lot about that in the past. Um, <clears throat> so uh, here in North Carolina, our numbers um, are, are also still modestly decreasing. We never quite hit the peaks that the other states in the southeast did, um, which, is, which is fortunate. Um, our hospitalizations are relatively stable um, across the state. Um, and here in the Triad region, our numbers are also uh, modestly decreasing since uh, an apparent peak around mid-July. Um, our hospitalizations in the area have also decreased somewhat. Um, I would use the term modestly. Um, and um, our percentages of positive tests, which seems people seem to be catching on that to that as a metric, have declined um, both in the state and the Triad region. Uh, in the last uh, month and a half. So when, <clears throat> when, when at their height um, in, in early part of July, they were running about 11 to 12 percent um, in, uh, in the state and roughly about uh, 10 to 11 percent here in the triad. Now they're down to um, about 8 percent statewide and somewhere between 6 to 8 percent in Forsyth County anyway, which is where I looked at the numbers today. Um, and uh, it, it depends a little bit on the day of the week, and, um, but, uh, but they, they are declining. Um, this is all good news. Um, one has to put into perspective a little bit, though, um, what positive tests, percentage of positive tests are. Is, is the number of tests that are positive divided by the number of total tests? So. If you would go to a population that you would think would be very unlikely to have COVID, your percent positive test is going to be very low. If you go to a population that has a high chance of having COVID, which would be people with fevers, coughs, muscle aches, 
um, from the higher impacted zip codes, then you're going to have percentages roughly around 10 percent, 11 percent. Um, so it depends a little bit. Um, it's interesting in our preoperative testing um, in, in our area um, from a lot of hospitals, um, and these are tests done of asymptomatic people before going to surgery. Our positive percentages is about 0.4, so well under 1%. So that would be a, a representation of a, of a cross-section of the community. So that kind of gives you an idea a little bit about, um, about positive testing, uh, positive percent testing. And so you have to take it a little bit in context. I would say here in the triad we're probably more likely, especially right now, uh, for, for reasons we'll talk about in a minute, <laughs> um, I think we're more likely to be testing symptomatic people than asymptomatic people. Um, and, um, and a lot of you who have wanted to get tests, I think, have run into that. <clears throat> now, um, there's been a lot of stuff out in the last week and a half about masks and mask efficiency. Uh, so let's talk about masks for a minute. Uh, masks work. Um, and uh, masks decrease transmission of COVID from a person to another person or the environment. In other words, they keep your respiratory goblets that might have virus in them if you're asymptomatic or pre-symptomatically infected. Uh, they keep them to yourself um, rather than into the world. So that's good. It takes, uh, it takes an, uh, an R0 of transmission of 2.5 people infected from one person well down below one. If you get that R not below one, that means that transmission, if you could sustain that and if everyone did it, would eventually die out, which is a cool idea. So let's wear our masks. Not all masks are alike. The best masks have, um, have two, two layers of, of fabric, the cloth masks anyway, two layers of fabric, uh, and then they cover your nose and your mouth uh, and they fit relatively tightly on your face so that the, the respiratory droplets can't get out around the edges of them. Um, if they're below the nose, they don't work so well um, because um, your nose is not covered. If they're above the mouth, they're not going to work so well. Um, the, there are a couple kinds of masks that, that don't work as well as the others. Um, and one of them is the so-called neck gaiter, <clears throat> which looks kind of stylish and cool um, and um, it's you know usually worn down around the neck and you pull it up over the face kind of like a, a railroad bandit from a bad western um, and uh, <clears throat> those are very thin people who wear them um, tell me they're comfortable um, but unfortunately uh, because of the thinness of the fabric um, and the way they're designed they don't really work that was just proven by a study at Duke um, that got published this week. Um, and, uh, and so those are best avoided. The other mask, <coughs> excuse me, that's best avoided is, um, uh, is the kind that's got a valve on it. And that's that, that kind of mask is more of a, a mask that's designed for um, protecting yourself from um, you know, paint and aerosols that are in the air, like in construction. Um, and uh, that what happens with that valve is when you bleed, b breathe out, all of your respiratory droplets go out through the valve. So th that doesn't work so well either. Uh, so let's avoid the, the vented mask and let's avoid the gaiters. The other masks that you're going to see a little bit more of now are the uh, clear masks. There's clear fabric masks and clear plastic masks. Um, and um, while I haven't seen any specific studies of those because of the way they're designed, they, they should work. Um, but they, they allow people to see your mouth. Um, and uh, well, that may not be useful for a lot of us, but for people who teach, um, particularly languages, or work with people with communication difficulties, um, including people who are deaf, um, or if you're trying to teach a child with dyslexia, um, then looking, looking at the lips is very important. It's a very important part of the communication. So these masks can be used in those settings. Um, um, a lot of stuff still coming out about children, children and COVID. And so 
I know we talked about it last week, but I just kind of want to summarize a little bit because um, there's a, another study that people have been asking me about. Um, and, uh, and so, you know, you know, early on we were talking about um, how uh, kids weren't getting COVID as much and, and, and early on in the pandemic they reflected um, less than 1% of all of our COVID cases. Um, and now um, kids are about 10% of our COVID cases. Um, and so um, what's different? Well, um, early on in the pandemic, um, you know, we, m most of us were sheltering at home. And so our kids, uh, our kids were staying home um, and, um, and not getting, getting out and about as much. Um, and then the other aspect of it is, is that there were a lot of adults who still had to get out and about, people with essential jobs. Um, and, uh, and, you know, we had a lot of, a lot of uh, early on workplace related outbreaks, like uh, particularly, you know, meat packing plants and so on and so forth. Um, and, and, then, um, and then those adults proportionately represented a lot more of COVID than the kids would have just because they're the ones who are getting exposed early on. Our epidemiology is a little bit different now and it has been different over the summer. Um, and um, rather than having you know, these larger outbreaks and, and clusters relating to workplaces, our outbreaks now are more related to, um, to social gatherings, um, family get-togethers, and, um, um, and, and, and family units. Um, and these would include parties and, 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 um, and such. So um, because of that and because they're more household related, kids are involved a little bit more. But still, the kids are still only 10% of our um, of our COVID te um, cases, um, and so that it's still a relatively small proportion. So a study came out this week that was talked a lot about in the media, where you know 90,000 kids have been infected in the last month and a half, and so be, you know because there wasn't a lot of perspective put on that, and this was across the whole country, by the way, um, people I think started to think that you know, something changed about the virus. It's attacking kids now, or maybe we just weren't seeing them early. No, it has to do with the proportions. So, you know, if you have, if you have a million cases that occur in a month and a half, and, which is what happened, um, we've had a million cases in the, in, the, in the country now, then if you take the proportion due to kids of 10%, it's still a small number. So, but it, it looks large if you publish it. <laughs> but it's still proportionally small. So, you know, that number in that study really didn't surprise me at all, and that's what I would have estimated it to be just by doing some simple math on a piece of paper, knowing what our total cases are. So, kids do get COVID, and, um, but when they get it, um, they don't get as sick, particularly the younger kids do very, very well. Less than 1% of all of our hospitalizations in the country due to COVID have been in children. Um, and um, they, uh, so they, they do have a little bit, they are a little bit blessed in that setting. Can kids transmit COVID? They do, and the older the kid, the more they transmit like an adult. So older teenagers act like adults in a lot of other aspects anyway, anyway at least they, maybe they want to, but, they, um, but, but the older kids' epidemiology seems to be more like adult epidemiology as far as is their capability of transmitting it. Um, younger kids under the age of 10, though, are different, and um, we're still trying to figure out exactly why. A lot of cool theories out there to explore, um, but they, they probably are about half as capable as transmitting uh, as an adult. Um, and some of that may just come down to they don't move as much air, so there's not as many respiratory droplets. So um, where do kids tend to transmit infection? Um, is, uh, is in the household. And it, it's not thought to be uh, as, as a, a major driver or even a minor driver of transmission in the community at large. So a little bit about the epidemiology with kids. Um, the, um, 
and, and there was a question um, that, that was asked earlier, um, and I'll talk a little bit when we get to that, about the multi-system inflammatory syndrome, which is a very rare condition in kids that can follow COVID, um, and, and we'll talk about that then. Uh, tests. So uh, testing remains, um, I think, our, um, our, um, our biggest problem with managing COVID, um, both, both for populations and for individuals. Uh, with that big surge of cases that occurred throughout the South, sucked up a lot of our testing reagent. Um, and because in the last 20 years, we've moved to regional, large, large laboratory regional-based testing, these all responded to that um, portion of the pandemic in our country. And so all areas in the country suffered um, shortages of testing reagent. Um, and because of that, um, and because of the large number of tests that we had to do um, uh, here, even in North Carolina, that came from Florida and Texas, our turnaround time got real long. Uh, in fact, sometimes as long as, almost as long as 10 days. The average was, I think, seven. So that is getting better, okay? Um, and, and some of it's because we have less tests being submitted from other states. The other, the other reason is, is that uh, some of the laboratories have added equipment uh, and people to test more and faster. So I think the average turnaround time is declining now. Uh, and with our major contract labs, um, such as LabCorp and Quest, it's, it's down to two to four days, depending on, on transit time to get the specimen in the lab. So that's, that's a good sign because uh, contact tracing really loses its effectiveness um, after, after 72 hours. So we want to get those tests back quick. Um, so. Um, I think we're going to have intermittent shortages of testing reagents for a while yet, um, but, uh, but I, I do see um, some slow improvement in that uh, in the near future. Um, regarding contact tracing, so contact tracing is what happens when you get a positive case and then um, public health calls that case and says, hey, we know you were positive, we see it in our lab report. Um, tell me about the people you're around, and then you contact the people that that case was around. That's contact tracing. So because public health has to basically call people uh, based on cell phone numbers usually, um, that um, you know it's the, doing the contact training and uh, tracing and the informing, and then getting the quarantine down um, requires the person to pick up the phone that they're calling and. Uh, Public health is having some trouble um, getting um, people to answer the phone. And it's not all sinister. Uh, it's not all people trying to get out of, uh, out of quarantine. But a lot of it's just simply that um, people don't pick up the phone if they don't recognize the phone number. And, um, you know, I'm guilty of that. I, uh, you know, I, if I see something that I think is someone trying to sell me my extended car warranty, I'm probably not likely to pick up the phone. But um, you know, if, it, if it's labeled as coming from your county or from, um, um, from, uh, you know, from a public health entity, uh, you, you answer the phone. Um, it, it's gonna help you um, uh, more than anybody. So, um, so maybe we'll, we'll just wanna tell the car warranty people no thanks for a little while, um, but answer our phones. Um, a little bit about vaccines. Um, so, um, uh, you know, our vaccine development uh, continues to be, um, I, you know, I think encouraging. And as I said last week, I'm cautiously optimistic about it. And cautiously optimistic is about the best you'll get out of an infectious disease doctor. So that's pretty good. Um, and uh, the vaccines seem to be in the, in the early studies producing antibodies that neutralize the virus. Um, and they seem to be safe um, in the early studies. Now we need big studies now to prove that they actually work. Um, and we need uh, big studies to prove that they're actually safe in large numbers of people. Um, so um, it takes a lot of people to get in these vaccine studies to do this. 
um, the faster we can enroll people in these trials and get people the, the vaccine in order to find out these, the answers to these questions, the faster we will have a vaccine. And that's a good thing. So uh, here at Wake Forest Baptist Health, uh, we have now embarked and started our first uh, vaccine trial uh, with Moderna's vaccine, uh, which is a messenger RNA vaccine. It's been mentioned in the uh, media quite a bit. Uh, it's encouraging. Its early results look good. Uh, Two-shot series uh, produced neutralizing antibodies in just pretty much everybody in the early studies. So now we have to do big ones. So if you're interested in being part of a vaccine trial, um, here's what you do. And I'm going to read these numbers out. Um, and, and so get your pen and pencil. I'll give you a minute. Get a pen and pencil. Or get your phone out and type it in. Ready? Here's the phone number to call, 336-713-7888, or email COVID19VaccineStudy at wakehealth.edu. I'll say the last one again, COVID19VaccineStudy at wakehealth.edu. And we're going to add those, uh, the, those contact info to our um, Facebook Live um, little information box that you can get with it so, um, so you can have that. So if you're interested, um, the, the, you know, contact, call, call or write um, and see. Now, they're going to ask you um, to answer a bunch of questions um, about yourself um, and about where you live and what you do. Um, and then, and then, if you fall into a category that um, that would qualify for the vaccine trial, then you'll get contacted back. And the reason why why that's the case um, is because, if, for instance, the Moderna vaccine trial involves thirty thousand people, and in order for the vaccine to get in, um, to get approved by the FDA, you need to um, you need to enroll the right the right demographics of people. So you want a lot of women, you want a lot of men, you want a lot of young people, a lot of older people, people with underlying conditions, people who don't, so on and so forth. And you want them from areas where there's a fair amount of virus circulating. And so, you know, doing a vaccine study um, in, the middle of, uh, in the middle of Wyoming, that's where you're 100 miles from the nearest person, doesn't make sense because you can't see if the vaccine's going to work or not because there's no virus around. So, um, so they, they, the people in California running the trial, they're the ones who select the people. Um, but if you want to be on a list to be considered, put your, put your name in the hat. I, I would do it. Um, and, uh, and, um, and you can be part of, uh, of a really cool thing to help us find a great vaccine to use, um, which if all goes well, Hopefully we can start vaccinating people um, in late winter, early spring, um, after we've had um, some cases. So um, with that, I think I'll go ahead and start the questions um, from people. So um, Jill asks, um, are vaccine trials looking promising? Well, we just talked about that. Um, I think they are. Um, and then uh, she goes on to ask, will there be protocols for who gets the vaccines first? Uh, yes, there will be protocols about who gets the vaccine first. And so there's a lot of things to think about when you put protocols about how you, you prioritize vaccine. First thing is, is you want to give it to people where it works. So for instance, let's say the vaccine trial says that response in people over the age of 80 is like 20% because of age or other reasons, then, then what you want to do is, 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 is vaccinate the people around the 80-year-old and not the 80-year-old. Because um, vaccinating the 80-year-old is kind of futile. If it doesn't work, why give it to them? Okay? But, but you can vaccinate and form a protective cocoon in that household. So that's one example. Another example, who's more likely to be exposed to COVID? So, um, you know, these are people who um, are out and about um, and um, are essential workers um, and who, where there's a lot of COVID nursing home employees, people who work in prisons, um, 
hospital workers to some extent um, and uh, first responders, people like this. Um, and, um, and so th these are the factors that go into trying to figure out how to prioritize vaccine. There could be some geographic uh, aspects to it, so uh, prioritizing people uh, in geographic areas where there's more active transmission in cases occurring than when there's less. And then you have to think about the whole global scale, because it's not just HIS in the United States, but it's all the other countries in the world. So it can get kind of complicated. Um, can you comment on the antigen test versus the PCR test for COVID, and when should each test be used? Is one test more accurate than the other? Um, sure. So you're going to see more antigen testing coming out um, because the, uh, the readers um, and the uh, kits for doing it are, um, are, are coming out now, um, slow but sure. Um, and these, the antigen test can be done um, oftentimes as what's called a point of care test, which means it doesn't have to get sent anywhere. Um, and, um, and it doesn't have to get sent to a large laboratory or to a large hospital. And, and technically, it could even be done in a doctor's office if they have the, uh, if they have the reader and the, um, and the test kit. So it's kind of like that, that flu test that you get in the doctor's office, you know. You go to the doctor's office, I got a sore throat. Okay, let me test you for strep, let me test you for flu, and then they come back 20 minutes later and tell you the result. That's almost always an antigen test done at the doctor's office. And we use antigen tests for flu, we use it for strep. Um, and uh, a lot. Um, so now we have one for COVID. Um, the PCR test actually looks though for RNA, the, the genetic material of the virus. Uh, that test is done on a nasal swab where the antigen test is, or a nasal pharyngeal swab usually where the antigen test is done just from the nose. Um, so uh, the PCR is a little bit more um, sensitive uh, than the antigen test. Um, and um, we don't know yet about how many false positives we'll get out of the antigen test. There'll probably be a few, um, but um, we'll, we'll know more about that in a month or so. Um, so, but is that test good enough? Yes, in most cases it is. So if you have signs and symptoms compatible with COVID and the antigen test is positive, you got COVID, the problem comes a little bit more in using the antigen test for asymptomatic people. Um, if you have signs and symptoms of COVID and for some reason the antigen test comes back negative, your doctor may then want to do a PCR test on you just to confirm it. And so you might, you might find yourself in that situation. But, but for the most part, it's good enough. You know, it's 80% sensitive. Um, so for most people who have COVID, um, and have a fair amount of virus around, it's going to find it. And then we can, and it comes, the answer comes back quick in an hour or so. So then you can start your, start your isolation right away and public health can start the contact tracing right away. And this will slow the transmission of COVID in a community. So I think it's a good thing. Um, but what are my thoughts on COVID spreading through air conditioning systems? So this gets back to the droplet versus aerosol for transmission of COVID. And while aerosol transmission may occur in some specific closed indoor settings, such as a bar where a lot of people are yelling and there's a lot of droplets going out in the air and the air is getting jostled around and things can't settle down. But otherwise in buildings and such, um, it really isn't air airborne transmitted. Um, and it's never been shown to be transmitted in, um, in air conditioning or heating ventilation systems. Um, now, sometimes you can go out and with a big swab and swab around and you might find some messenger RNA of COVID in the system, but there has been, uh, no one's been able to find replication competent or viable alive virus in the system. And there's been no epidemiologic data um, to suggest that it goes. And the Navy's a great place to look for this because you have closed, closed ships uh, and you have shared, um, shared air conditioning between areas. And um, most of the, uh, I think all, the Navy's data is all um, that it's all been droplet oriented and not airborne. So I don't really think it goes through ventilation systems. I don't think you need to worry about it. 
Um, can you explain what you know about kids and MSC, uh, MISC? So this is the multi-inflammatory, um, multi-system inflammatory syndrome in children um, that we sometimes see following COVID. I, and uh, Jessica goes, asks, my husband and I both have had mild cases last month. We have a one-year-old and a seven-year-old that did not become symptomatic and were not tested. Are they at risk for having multi-system inflammatory syndrome in the future? I, you know, I think in, in your case, Jessica, I think that the odds of your kids getting MIS is really, really low. Um, and, uh, and, um, and for the following reasons. One is, is that there's only been about 500 cases described across the country. Um, it's, it's pretty rare. Um, and so, um, you know, if you just, just a roll of the dice would say that it's, it's just not going to happen. It's really rare. Um, also, it was a month or so ago, and most of the cases of multi-system inflammatory syndrome that we've seen in children have been in, an, in a range of two to six weeks, with most of those being actually in the first two weeks following COVID. Um, so, um, um, just based on time, I think it's pretty pretty darn unlikely in your kids. Um, and um, um, asymptomatic versus symptomatic, it seems like it can occur from both both ends. Maybe a little bit more on the symptomatic side, um, and, but um, than asymptomatic. Uh, and then the, the age range for multi-system uh, multi inflammatory syndrome, there's sort of kind of two presentations. One in older kids, that's more of multi-system inflammation that resembles that, that sometimes we see in adults. And then there's the younger age presentation, which looks like Kawasaki syndrome. So if you want to learn about Kawasaki syndrome, you can Google it. Um, but it, it's a certain kind of inflammatory syndrome in young children, and the age range for that tends to be between two to seven. Um, a little older than Kawasaki syndrome, but still it's uh, in the younger kids. Um, the, the good news is that most of the kids who get multi-system inflammatory syndrome, while the, while the, the syndrome itself is, 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 you know, it's serious, you know, almost all those kids get hospitalized, and, and a third will end up in an ICU. The vast majority of them um, recover and do well after a week or two, and um, and so, um, I, you know, it's I think that's that part of it's great. We want to see our kids do well when they get sick. What are the long-term consequences of contacting COVID, symptomatic or not? How likely, would, what percent have long-term consequences? How do these long-term consequences compare with other common respiratory illnesses? Um, um, for example, do other respiratory illnesses cause long-term lung damage? Um, so this is a great question. Um, so um, there are, yes, respiratory viruses can cause long-term lung damage, uh, and that includes uh, unusual cases from influenza. It can occur from something called parainfluenza, which is another respiratory virus. It can occur from RSV, which is uh, another respiratory virus we can get, and from adenovirus. Um, it, it's, it's unusual for long-term lung damage from these, but, but, it, but it does happen. Um, there are also other long-term consequences from other respiratory viruses, and, and this is not well understood, but um, kind of fatigue syndromes um, or um, um, where, where people just don't feel well after these and, and for some period of time, weeks to months, occasionally years. This is also relatively uncommon. Uh, do these things occur with COVID? Yes, it does seem that they do. Um, the long-term lung damage, um, we're still sorting out, um, but, but there, there can be some, particularly from the more severe cases of COVID. How serious is that? Well, I think for a lot of people, that long-term lung advantage may not, damage may not even be recognized um, because we have a lot of reserve in our lungs. And so in order to get symptoms of chronic lung disease, you have to knock out a fair amount of lung tissue. So if you knock out 10%, you're not even gonna know it. But if you're an athlete, um, and, um, and let's say you're a wide receiver on a college team, 
and you happen to have some promise and you get COVID, losing 10% of your lung function may take a bit of time off your, your 50 yard dash. And if you're, if you're going at the combine from the NFL, that might make a difference. Um, so, you know, it's just something to think about. Um, there are other potential long-term consequences of COVID. Um, and um, there's been some information over the summer now about myocarditis following COVID, which is an inflammation in the heart, um, which can be found uh, in people with, even sometimes with mild to moderate symptoms, but usually follows the more severe cases. So more to come on that. Um, and this will be something that we'll, um, we need to be watching over the next few years, actually, to find out are there long-term health consequences of COVID like they are from some, like they are from some of the other respiratory viruses? Uh, Judy asks, if you contracted COVID, would the fact that you had taken the pneumonia shot help you with your recovery? Yes, it could. Uh, it could. Get the pneumonia shot. If, you, if, you need the pneumo if you're supposed to have the pneumonia shot um, for other reasons, and this is usually in people who are over the age of 50 to 60 or so, um, and talk to your doctor about getting it. Cause, um, or if you have underlying health problems, talk to your doctor about getting it. About, I think it's about 10%, 10 to 15% of COVID, maybe a little bit less than that. I just saw a study, I think, that said around 8 to 10% of people who get COVID and have respiratory involvement, like viral pneumonia from COVID, can go on to get a bacterial pneumonia um, immediately afterwards. And so a pneumonia shot will help prevent that. So get the pneumonia shot. If you're due for it, get the flu shot. Everyone needs a flu shot this year, everybody. Uh, anyone over the age of six months of age, get a flu shot. Uh, this, uh, this year, more than ever, get a flu shot. And the flu shots are out now, by the way. You'll start to start, you sh should start seeing signs that they're available. Uh, so talk to your doctor or look at your pharmacy. Get a flu shot. Um, how are most hospitals treating COVID patients? What medications are they giving and are they treating with plasma? So most, uh, most patients who get hospitalized with COVID are gonna get remdesivir, most of them. There are, there are some times when we can't give it um, because of uh, under, the, the type of underlying medical problem might, um, might be associated with um, an adverse effect, but most people will get it. If you've had COVID symptoms for more than 10 days or so, remdesivir may not work as well. And it's because remdesivir kills the virus um, or slows viral replication actually. And so if it gets in the way of viral replication that by day 10, you don't have much viral replication going on anymore. In fact, by day 10, it's done. And so remdesivir is not gonna really help you much then. So getting it early works better. And there are some drug trials going on right now with oral agents that appear to have activity against COVID uh, in the early trials. So um, these potentially could be given at a doctor's office or called in and could be given for treatment or even prevention for families um, before you know, the symptoms have gone on a long time. And those, I think, would have hold some promise. The other thing we're, we're doing for outpatients in the hospital is using steroids for people who have severe um, in lung involvement because a lot of that is from the inflammation um, and the immune response from our body and not necessarily from the virus. So we try to cool that down with steroids. And it seems to, it seems to help actually. It reduces the length of time in the ICU and, and studies and it actually reduces deaths um, from, from the study in England. And so most hospitals are doing that. And my personal experience with it in our health system is I think it gets people out of the ICU faster. So I'm, a, I'm an advocate of that. Um, plasma for a while, um, you know, our health system as well as others, we're, we're um, using convalescent plasma, which is serum from people who've had COVID because it might have antibodies in it. And we were using that to treat people, thinking that it might neutralize the virus a uh, fairly large study on that, a um, big randomized control trial that was well done, came out with 
last two weeks ago. Um, and uh, unfortunately, in using it uh, for people who have moderate to severe symptoms who are in the hospital, so it's mostly ICU patients who are in the hospital, it didn't really work that well. We don't know if it would work well for people who are in the early stages of their infection while there is still active viral replication because the plasma would have an antibody. If the virus is out there replicating, the antibody attaches to the virus, it might work better. So it may be the reason why that study didn't show um, that, it, uh, that it worked is because uh, it was given after viral replication was mostly over. So we'll still see plasma being used in trials, but right now we're not using it in our ICU patients. Um, how long can someone be asymptomatic? Well, if you're asymptomatically infected, you're, you, you can be, it's usually a little bit longer than if you were symptomatically infected. Um, and, uh, but it's still less than 10 days. So if you had a positive COVID test and you're asymptomatic, after 10 days you can come out of isolation um, because you're not infectious anymore, um, unless you're immunocompromised for some reason. Could you compare face masks versus face shields or wearing both? Can the eyes be at risk for droplets entering the body? Face shields are more comfortable. Kids might wear better and would cover the entire face. So face shields don't work as well as a face mask because um, the, the, you know, the virus can come down or get around them on the sides with exhalation. Masks work better, but face shields are better than nothing. Um, and, um, and sometimes um, they're the only thing you can do um, because wearing a mask wouldn't be safe. Uh, there are some people who can't wear masks uh, because of uh, you know, underlying a underlying lung problem, they can't get enough air, um, or severe cases of claustrophobia, uh, so on and so forth. And so for those cases, face shield's a reasonable alternative, but not, still not as good as a mask. Other times when face shields are used um, is, uh, is, in a, is, you might say, an instruction like in a swimming lesson or something. Obviously, you can't wear a mask in a swimming pool, and it's probably fine in that situation. Um, and, uh, and there may be some kids who just won't wear a mask or can't wear a mask where a face shield might be used as an alternative, but it's not as good as a, uh, not as good as a mask. Um, Mike asks, can you talk a little bit about dance classes for high school age students? What would those studios need to do in order to present a safe area for the teachers and students? Well, first, hi Mike, um, second is, that's a pretty specific area and, and an interesting one because there's a lot of things about dance um, that you need to, th need to maybe modify the usual precautions that, we, that you would use. And, um, and one of those is that there's a lot of air movement. So I think dancers should be masked when they're, they're dancing. Two is that if it's in a studio and there's more than one person in the studio, you're gonna wanna be separated. Um, three is, is that between dance classes, um, you're going to want to, uh, you want to, you're going to want to wipe down and disinfect the horizontal surfaces in the studio, which doesn't take too long. Uh, four is that, uh, hand hygiene is important. So, um, dancers hand hygiene going in the studio, dancers hand hygiene going out of the studio. If you're doing one routine, you dance, you hand hygiene before that routine. When you go on to the next routine, you hand hygiene between them. And so you, you mix hand hygiene with what you're doing. Um, and then lastly, it, the studio itself, where you're dancing, it may not be necessarily as much risk as the areas around the studio. So where are the dancers changing? Um, and so locker rooms or you know, fitting rooms are an area where, where there is gonna be a higher risk of transmission. They're usually small, there's a lot of people in there uh, and a lot of jostling and such going on. So dancers probably should come to the studio in their outfit and leave in their outfit rather than changing there. Um, and then also other areas in the dance studio are gonna have to be cleaned often, restrooms, bathrooms, so on and so forth. Break rooms and where places where kids might socialize 
uh, are going to have to be looked over after to make sure uh, that people are personally distancing and wearing their masks while in there. I think if you do all those things, uh, it's safe uh, to return to dance. Um, yeah, but, uh, but those would be things that I would think about doing. Not that I'm a dancer, by the way. <laughs> I don't even play one on TV. All right, so uh, can you please explain why it's safe? This is from Sarah. For school children to play in band class when they return in person learning, our school insists this is, and I want my child to play. I just can't figure out how it's okay. You know, I did a lot of thinking about band um, for colleges in our area and also for high schools in our area uh, when we were thinking about um, coming back to school. Um, and there's a lot of things about band that are different. One is there's a lot of movement of air uh, with wind instruments. Um, and, um, and, and while a brass instrument, technically, the air, doesn't, the air doesn't come out the end of the brass instrument really so much. It's a vibration within the brass instrument. There's a lot of spit accumulation in the, in the brass instrument. And, and that spit is expelled, and by most band players, it's expelled either on the floor or into a cup in the area, and that spit, if that person has virus in them, there's going to be a lot of virus in that spit. And, um, and so band is, is a higher risk activity. Um, the other wind instruments, clarinets, flutes, so on and so forth, there you have a lot of wind going out, and when you're expelling a lot of air, the more air expelled, the more, the more respiratory particles. And if there's virus in those particles, the more virus out in the world. So I, I think band is, is, is a higher risk activity in schools. Um, and how can you mitigate that risk? Well, do it outside. Uh, have people 12 feet apart when they're playing. So marching band with large spreads for the people um, are safer than not. But doing it inside, I'd probably just avoid it. Um, I, I think it's too risky. Now, string instruments are a little different. You don't have all the air movement, so violins, cellos, so. Um, so string ensembles and things like this, I think you can, you can still do. Um, vocal, uh, what about chorus um, and singing? Those are areas also that if you're going to do it, you're going to need to do it in a distanced way, and people are going to have to be masked. And unfortunately, masking changes the vocal you know, characteristics of the notes and such. So a lot of choruses have just said it's not worth it, um, unless you want to go outside. But even then, it, it just doesn't sound the same. So unfortunately, those are activities, I think, that are more difficult to do. I wish it wasn't so, but it is. So with that, we got through the questions, kind of a long, long briefing this morning. But I'll open it up. Uh, to my, uh, to my buddies and friends out there um, who've got cameras on me from the stations, and if they have any questions. Dr. Rulich, a couple questions. Football, it's on everyone's mind right now. The other, yesterday, North Carolina pushed all their sports into next year for spring football, so we won't have high school football. What are your thoughts on all that? And you know, we're, the ACC, which Wake Forest is part of, is still playing on playing football this year. What are your thoughts on it? how we're going to get through having some sort of football this year. Yeah, I get, I get asked a lot, a lot about football, and, you know, I'll put it out there. I like a good game of football. I'm a fan. Um, but I tell you, I, I don't really see any way to play football with the, the current state of the pandemic in the U.S. And even if it got a lot better, I think it's going to be difficult. I mean, football's a contact sport. We've already, I mean, we've been having problems with, uh, with cases in college football teams already. There's probably not one that hasn't been touched by COVID, by the way. And if they say they haven't been, I'm not sure that they're telling you the right answer. Um, and, and, you know, this is, this is going to happen. And so when, when you get football, like, people who have COVID in football, you're going to have the, the infected person or persons, and then you're also going to have people quarantined who happen to train around that person. So you're going to lose fairly large segments of your team. And how are you going to play like that? If you're a quarterback and you have no offensive line, it seems a little scary to me. Um, and so uh, I, I, you know, I just think the logistics are going to be so hard to do it. And you know, there, 
there have been two, you know, is it the Pac-10 and um, I think in the Big Ten now, right? Pac-12 and the, and the Big Ten have said, hey, you know, it's, we're not doing it. Um, and, you know, stand by um, maybe in the spring, but we're not doing it now. And, um, and then um, will the ACC come along? I think they probably will, um, but you know, the, there's a lot of a lot of things for them to think about. It's not all just about COVID, but um, but I I think uh, and again, remember what I said earlier. If you're a player and you get COVID and you lose 10% of your lung function, hey, yeah, you may be able to function throughout your whole life, fine. But is that going to take time off your combine? Is that something you want to live with? Do you want to give up a year of eligibility for that? So there's some decisions to be made at the player level and the family level too. Um, and then also, you know, the primary mission of our universities is to teach and learn. Um, so if sports get in the way of that, it's, anyway. Now uh, for high school, so high schools have put off their sports um, in the November. Um, you know, maybe a little bit of wishful thinking, things will be better then. I, I, I doubt they will be. Um, it may be just kicking the can down the road. Um, but, um, and then the, there's the whole other part. If we're not opening our schools, why are we having high school sports? I, yeah, it's just a little bit of irony to me. So, um, so I, I think that's where we're sitting right now. And another thing that's come out this week is that the, the uh, myocarditis, the NCAA, has, it's become a big issue with that for, for athletes who apparently catch the code. Yeah, my, what is, what is that? yeah, so myocarditis following COVID, we touched on it earlier. Myocarditis is an inflammation in the heart that is associated with COVID. We don't totally understand it real well, but, but, um, but it may be related to, to teeny, teeny, tiny little blood clots that sometimes can form in COVID. So if it happens in your heart, it causes a little bit of inflammation around them. And why all of a sudden are people thinking about it and worried about it? Well, a couple of reasons. One, there was two studies out of Germany looking at people who recovered for COVID who were totally fine and, and had all their symptoms had resolved. Hey, you know, I'm fine. And they, had, they did scans on their hearts, uh, MRI scanning on their hearts, and they found low-grade myocarditis in these people. They were asymptomatic with it. And so far, these people haven't had complications such as heart attacks or, or rhythm problems in their hearts. But um, you know, it's an open question: Could that happen? Um, and so, for athletes who are putting a lot of stress on their on their hearts, you know, ha high heart rates uh, with large stroke volumes of the heart, the heart's working hard. And so, if you have a heart that's a little bit stressed out and you're making it work real hard, could it flip an abnormal rhythm? We call that sudden death. It's not a good thing, um, and so, so that's one thing that's been thought about. Because, you know, the sports medicine people have been saying, following your recovery from COVID, you're good to go. You know, your cardio exercise and everything you want to do, you can do just like you did before. And I think they're rethinking that a tad bit now. The other thing is, is that you know there was the pitcher, um, um, I forget what team he was on who developed post-COVID myocarditis and now is out for the season. Um, so was it the Mar Marlins, I think? Yeah. I, so anyway, um, so that's why people are talking about it. Um, and and, and it's, it's a real entity and, um, and, and I think it needs to be thought about seriously. Yeah. Any other questions? All right, I think that's all I have to say about that. <laughs>